Dr. Carl Richard is a professor of history at the University of Louisiana Lafayette, where his research and teaching focus is on early national American history and U.S. intellectual history. Richard has authored several works, including a book just out in 2010 entitled Why We Are All Roman. Um, in 2008, he published Greeks and Romans Bearing Gifts, How the Ancients Inspired the Founding Fathers. He also published The Battle for the American Mind, A Brief History of a Nation's Thought, and Twelve Greeks and Romans Who Changed the World. I had the opportunity today to listen to him speak about all 12 of those figures uh, briefly. Uh, Professor Richard Lee, uh, received his Ph.D. from Vanderbilt University and has been at uh, University of Louisiana now for some 20 years, I think, we decided this morning. In addition to his uh, ac uh, academic work and his fine intellect, which we've become acquainted with, uh, Professor Richard is a gentleman and uh, uh, a good friend of uh, of the university, we hope, after your brief visit, Professor Richard. His topic today is the classical roots of the American founding. I think by intellect he meant uh, smart aleck remarks, as we, they've become accustomed to over the last day. Uh, yes, today I'm going to talk about the classical roots of the American founding. Uh, the Greek and Roman classics exerted a formative influence on the founders of the United States. The classics furnished the founders with a rich set of symbols, models, anti-models, and ideas. The classics provided the founders with a sense of identity and purpose, assuring them that their exertions were part of a grand universal scheme. The classics furnished the theories of popular sovereignty, mixed government theory, and natural law that laid the foundations of the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. The classics contributed a great deal to the founders' conception of human nature, to their understanding of the nature and purpose of virtue, and to their appreciation of society's essential role in its production. The classics offered the founders companionship and solace, emotional resources necessary for coping with the deaths and disasters so common in their era. In short, the classics supplied a large portion of the founders' intellectual tools. The principal means by which the classical heritage was transmitted from one generation to the next was the educational system. The founders' classical training frequently began around age eight whether under the direction of public grammar school masters or private tutors. Colonial American curricula emphasize Latin, particularly Cicero, Virgil, and Horace, though time was also set aside for the Greek New Testament, Homer, Aristotle, and Euclid. In fact, the word grammar in grammar school referred to Greek and Latin grammar, not English grammar. The mother tongue was not taught in American schools until after the Revolutionary War, since most 18th century Americans believed that precious school time should be reserved for serious academic subjects like the classical languages, not wasted on knowledge the child could learn at home. That's how they looked at it. The better teachers, such as James Madison's instructor, J Donald Robin Robertson, excuse me, went beyond the short list of classical authors. Robertson instructed his students in the works of Herodotus, Thucydides, Plato, Julius Caesar, Tacitus, and many others. Madison's early training was so thorough that although he arrived at the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton, in 1769, only two weeks before final examinations, he passed them all. Madison later testified regarding Robertson, all that I have been in life I owe to that man. The college curricula were as standardized and classically based as the grammar school curricula, requiring three or four years of further training in the classical languages. College students frequently joined secret societies that assigned them pseudonyms taken from ancient history. While they were students and frequently afterward, the founders kept commonplace books 
notebooks in which they copied the literary passages that most interested them. These were often excerpts from Greek, the Greek and Latin classics. Commencement exercises generally featured exhibitions in which students competed for prizes by reading Greek and Latin or by speaking Latin extemporaneously. The founders were so thoroughly conditioned to associate the works of certain ancient republicans with personal and societal virtue that they were left unable to imagine the teaching of virtue independent of the teaching of the classics. Hence, the transmission of the classical heritage became one of their most urgent concerns. John Adams heckled his son, John Quincy, ceaselessly not to fall behind in his classical studies. Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr even saw to it that their daughters became familiar with the classics, an unusual acquisition for women of that day. The founders used classical symbols and allusions to communicate, to impress, and to persuade. With a single classical pseudonym, statue, or illusion, a gentleman could be certain of generating a chain of associations in the minds of his audience. To appropriate such emblems was to claim social status for oneself and the support of venerable authorities for one's cause. Classical symbols provided badges of class, taste, wisdom, and virtue. To use them aptly was to claim the endorsement of ancient sages, the very longevity of, of whose reputations attested to their greatness. Hence the founders frequently enveloped themselves and their causes in classical symbols, much as modern politicians wrapped themselves and their policies in the flag. The most common symbol was the pseudonym and Alexander Hamilton was one of its most adept users. Just for uh, one instance, uh, Hamilton used Phocion as his pseudonym for an open letter to the citizens of New York opposing a state law that would confiscate more Tory property. Hamilton was suggesting that his fellow New Yorkers emulate the fourth century BC Athenian general Phocion uh, his legendary magnanimity towards his opponents, which is what Plutarch said he was most famous for. Meanwhile, Thomas Jefferson led the neoclassical movement in American architecture, helping to design the Virginia State Capitol, the U.S. Capitol, the University of Virginia campus, and his own home at Monticello. His designs were based on such Roman structures as the Pantheon, the Maison Carré at Nîmes, and various Roman villas. Ancient history also provided the founders with important models of personal behavior, social practice, and government form. One of the founders' greatest heroes was Cincinnatus, the fifth century BC Roman, who, having been granted dictatorial powers for a six month period and having defeated the enemies who threatened the city in just 15 days, immediately resigned his dictatorship and retired to the plow. George Washington not only took notice of the fact that people often compared him to Cincinnatus, but also worked consciously to promote the analogy. Washington recognized that his appeal, his popular appeal, lay not in military victories, of which he had precious few actually, but in the Republican virtue revealed in his surrender of power. Thus, Washington never offered to resign as commander of the Continental Army, even after the worst defeats, because he did not wish to spoil by anticipation the offer of resignation that he planned once he had, like Cincinnatus, defeated the enemy. Soon after that day arrived in 1783, Washington withdrew completely from public life, even going to the extreme of resigning from his local vestry. So he was playing the role of Cincinnati's complete uh, withdrawal of power, from power. In his letters of 1784, Washington referred to Mount Vernon as his villa, a Latin term he had never before employed in allusion to his estate. Sounding like the Roman poet Horace, he referred to himself, quote, as a, a private citizen of America on the banks of the Potomac, uh, 
under my vine and my own fig tree, free from the bustle of a camp and the intrigues of a court. Proud of his position as the first president of the Society of the Cincinnati, an association of Revolutionary War veterans, Washington demanded reforms when popular fears of the organization threatened to destroy the image associated with its name. The founders also admired Cato the Younger and Cicero, who died defending the Roman Republic. A great fan of Joseph Addison's Cato, an enormously popular play based closely on Plutarch's lives of Cato and Caesar, George Washington often drew upon the play. In 1775, he prevented the resignation of General John Thomas, who was angered by an unjust emotion, by paraphrasing Cato's line, quote, surely every post ought to be deemed honorable in which a man can serve his country, end quote. Despite congressional resolutions in 1774 and 1778 prohibiting all public officials from attending plays, Washington ordered Cato performed at Valley Forge. He hoped to improve the soldiers' morale by inspiring them with the example of Cato's men, who had demonstrated extreme selflessness in the struggle for liberty. During these difficult times, Washington often repeated another line from Cato, the play, "'Tis not in mortals to command success." Perhaps it was Cato's willingness to sacrifice his property on behalf of the Republic that led Washington to reproach his overseer for placating British troops with grain. Washington declared that the overseer should allow Mount Vernon to be leveled before giving any aid to the enemy. In 1783, Washington turned to Cato, the play, when his officers, furious over Congress's perpetual inability to pay them, mutinied at Newburgh, New York. The rebels planned to threaten the states with a coup unless they yielded more power to Congress. Although Washington considered the strengthening of the weak Congress vital to national survival, he perceived even the threat of a military coup as dangerous and dishonorable. In his speech to the officers, he employed the same three tactics that Cato used to face down his own mutineers in Act Three, Scene Five of Addison's play. First, Washington rebuked the anonymous author of a circular letter that urged mutiny, just as Cato had lambasted his rebels. Second, like Cato, Washington pleaded with his officers not to tarnish the Republican honor they had won by turning against the Republic. Third, like Cato, Washington appealed to the sympathy and respect his past service had earned him. And, and he did that very effectively. What he did was he, he carefully took his speech out of his pocket and he carefully took his uh, uh, glasses and his spectacles and he said, uh, pardon me for putting on my spectacles, but I have grown not only gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. And there was not a dry eye in the house, and then he had them in his, in his palm. Washington even paraphrased lines from Cato in his own speech. Other founders utilized Addison's Cato. The two most famous lines of the American Revolution, Patrick Henry's, give me liberty or give, or give me death, and Nathan Hale's, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country, were paraphrases of lines from the play. While Washington derived the sense of identity and purpose from his emulation of Cato, John Adams derived the same benefits from his lifelong identification with Cicero. As early as 1758, Adams gloried in the fact that law, his chosen profession, was, quote, a field in which Demosthenes, Cicero, and others of immortal fame have exalted before me. In 1774, Adams urged an aspiring politician to adopt Cicero as his model. He wrote regarding Cicero's proconsulship of Lilybaeum in Sicily. Quote, he did not receive this office as persons do nowadays, as a gift or a farm, but as a public trust, and considered it as a theater in which the eyes of the world were upon him. 
Adams added that when Rome was short of grain, Cicero managed to feed the city without treating his own province unfairly. When Adams, one of the greatest orators of his day, Rose, much better orator than Jefferson. Jefferson was a lousy speaker, and that's why Adams was the one who always, always was out front giving the speeches. Uh, when Adams, one of the greatest orators of his day, rose before the Continental Congress on July 1st, 1776, to rebut John Dickinson's contention that American independ independence would be premature, the New Englander thought of Cicero. He recorded in his diary, I began by saying that this was the first time in my life that I had ever wished for the talents and eloquence of the ancient orators of Greece and Rome, for I was very sure that none of them had ever before him a question of more importance to his country and to the world. Adams' admiration for Cicero outlived the American Revolution. He spent the summer of 1796, several months before assuming the presidency, rereading the Roman statesman's essays. In 1803, Adams quoted Cicero regarding the true public servant. Such a man will devote himself entirely to the Republic, nor will he covet power or riches. He will adhere closely to justice and equity that, provided he can preserve these virtues, although he may give offense and create enemies by them, he will set death itself at defiance rather than abandon his principles. No one followed this ethic better than Adams. In the 1760s, he refused the lucrative and prestigious position of admiralty court judge because he considered the juryless British courts unconstitutional. In 1770, he sacrificed his popularity to defend the British soldiers accused of murder in the so-called Boston Massacre. As president in 1799-1800, he made peace with Napoleonic France, leaving Thomas Jefferson, ironically his opponent, the glory of the Louisiana Purchase three years later at the expense of his own re-election because it split his party. There were people like Hamilton that wanted war with, with France. While no other founder yearned so much for popularity, none so continually sacrificed it to a strict code of ethics. It is not fanciful to suppose that, when making such painful decisions, Adams found consolation in contemplating the Roman statesman's sacrifices and the eternal glory they had earned him. The founders also encountered societal models among the ancients. When Samuel Adams, uh, John Adams' cousin, and often called, I think rightly, the father of the American Revolution, when Samuel Adams prayed that Boston would become, quote, a Christian Sparta, he referred to Spartan frugality, selflessness, valor, and patriotism. James Wilson applauded the openness of Athens and Republican Rome, as well as the frugality and temperance of the latter city. The founders also turned to the ancients, most notably the Greek republics of the 5th and 4th centuries BC, and the Roman Republic from the 6th to the 1st century BC for models of government. In the revolutionary period, the founders frequently applauded the Greek Republic's lenient treatment of their colonies. In 1775, John Adams noted, the Greeks planted colonies and neither demanded nor pretended any authority over them, but they became distinct independent commonwealths. Adams suggested that the British should follow such a policy with regard to their own American colonies. The Roman Republic was even an, an even more popular model. In his famous 70, 1772 speech commemorating the Boston Massacre, Joseph Warren declared concerning the Roman love of liberty, it was this noble attachment to a free constitution which, ra which raised ancient Rome from the smallest beginnings to the bright summit of happiness and glory to which she arrived. Classical models gave the founders a sense of identity and purpose. In 1813, Jefferson wrote to Adams, the same political parties which now agitate the U.S. have existed through all time. Whether the power of the people or that of the Aristoi should prevail were questions which kept the states of Greece and Rome in eternal convulsions as they now schismatize every people whose minds and mouths 
are not shut up by the gag of a despot. This perception of ancient history gave Jefferson the satisfaction of believing that his own democratic exertion, exertions were part of a grand universal scheme. To the founders, the study of the past was not a mere antiquarian hobby. The past was alive with personal and social meaning. Their perception of that living past shaped their own identities. The conflicts of the revolutionary and constitutional periods increased the founders' sense of kinship with the ancients. Proud of America's firm resistance to the intolerable acts, Samuel Adams declared in 1774, I think our countrymen discover the spirit of Rome or Sparta. In a 1776 letter to George Wythe, John Adams exulted, you and I, my dear friend, have been sent into life at a time when the greatest lawgivers of antiquity would have wished to have lived. In the same year, shortly after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Charles Lee told Patrick Henry, I used to regret not being thrown into the world in the glamorous third or fourth century BC of the Romans, but now I am thoroughly reconciled to my lot. Edmund Pendleton, cherish the memory of the Virginia Constitutional Convention of 1776, recalling, the young boasted that they were treading upon the Republican ground of Greece and Rome. In 1777, George Washington replied to British General John Burgoyne's peace offers, quote, the associated armies in America act from the noblest motive, liberty. The same principles actuated the arms of Rome in the days of her glory and the same object was the reward of Roman valor. George Tucker later recalled the excitement of these days, writing regarding Henry's liberty or death speech. Imagine to yourself this speech delivered with the calm dignity of Cato of Utica, that's Cato the Younger. Imagine to yourself the Roman Senate assembled in the capital when it was entered by the profane Gauls. Imagine that you had heard Cato addressing such a Senate. Never mind that to achieve the image he wished to convey, Tucker had to join a Roman hero from one epoch with a Senate from another era. The image was real to Tucker. As late as 1805, John Adams declared concerning Conyers Middleton's Life of Cicero, I seem to read the history of all ages and nations in every page, and especially the history of our country for 40 years Change the names and every anecdote will be applicable to us. Imagine the founders' excitement at the opportunity to match their ancient hero's struggles against tyranny and their sage construction of durable republics to rival the noble deeds that had filled their youth. The founders were thrilled by the belief that they were beginning anew the work of the ancient republicans, only this time with an unprecedented chance of success. Cato and Cicero had lost the first round of combat against the tyranny of Caesar and Augustus, but the founders, starting afresh in a virgin country with limitless resources, could pack the punch that would win the second and decisive round. The founders' classical anti-models, I call, call them anti-models, those ancient individual societies and government forms whose vices they wished to avoid, were as significant as their models. The founders' immersion in the classics gave them a suspicious cast of mind. Steeped in a literature whose perpetual theme was the steady encroachment of tyranny on liberty, the founders became virtually obsessed with spotting its approach so that they might avoid the fate of their classical heroes. This fear accounts for the founders' fierce reaction against the modest taxes Parliament sought to impose on the American colonies in the 1760s. The horror and disgust that ancient historians' accounts of Roman imperial corruption had instilled in the founders' minds in their, youthful, in their youth accounts for much of their exaggeration of the brutality of the well-intentioned but inept George III. It has been said of the American Revolution that never was there a revolution with so little cause. Whatever his fault, his faults, excuse me, George III was hardly Caligula or Nero, uh, 
as the revolutionaries claimed. However illegitimate, the moderate British taxes were hardly equivalent to the mass executions of the Roman emperors, as they suggested. But since the founders believed that the central lesson of ancient history was that every illegitimate power, however small, ended in slavery, basically the slippery slope argument, they were determined to resist every such power. Even legitimate authority should be used sparingly, lest it grow into illegitimate powers. Young Thomas Jeff Jefferson copied into his commonplace book The Warning of Tacitus, quote, the more corrupt the commonwealth, the more numerous its laws, end quote. John Adams declared regarding the spirit of liberty, obsta principis, resist the beginnings of tyranny, is her motto and maxim, knowing her enemies are secret and cunning, making their earliest advances slowly, silently, and softly. He then cited Tacitus on the insidiousness of despotism. John Dickinson argued that the smaller the illegitimate uh, tax, the greater the danger since the more easily it would be accepted by the incautious, thereby establishing a precedent for greater encroachments. Dickinson concluded, quote, nations in general are not apt to think until they feel, therefore nations in general have lost their liberty. The reverse side of the founders' reverence for Cato and Cicero was their distaste for Caesar, whose corruption of the Roman Republic had resulted in the rise of the emperors. In a famous part of Patrick Henry's Stamp Act speech of 1765, Henry even compared George III to Caesar, declaring, Caesar had his Brutus, Charles I his Cromwell, and George III, cries of treason, may profit by their example. Christopher Gadsden and Josiah Quincy summed up patriot sentiment when both claimed that Great Britain was to America what Caesar was to Rome, a corrupting influence. Both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson compared Alexander Hamilton, their opponent, to Caesar. Adams wrote, when Burr shot Hamilton, it was not Brutus killing Caesar in the Senate House, but it was killing him before he passed the Rubicon. In 1811, Jefferson told the story that at a party Jefferson had hosted while Secretary of State in 1791, Hamilton had inquired into the identity of the three men portrayed in Jefferson's wall paintings. When Jefferson replied that they were, quote, the greatest men the world had ever produced, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, and John Locke, there had been a pause. Hamilton had then declared that the greatest man that ever lived was Julius Caesar, end quote. Jefferson considered the story highly significant. While Jefferson, a true Republican, modeled himself after men of learning, Hamilton, a secret monarchist, this is Jefferson's point of view, modeled himself after a military figure who had done more than anyone else to corrupt and overturn the, Roman, the illustrious Roman Republic. Now the only problem with this is that uh, Jefferson writes this 20 years later, none of the other people there claimed that this happened. Uh, Jefferson claimed it 20 years later. And uh, the evidence indicates that either Jefferson misunderstood Hamilton or Hamilton was playing a joke on the humorless Virginian. And Jefferson really was humorless. In fact, uh, when he was on the Declaration of Independence Committee, there were five of them, the reason they chose Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence rather than Franklin was they were afraid that Franklin couldn't resist the temptation to insert a joke into the uh, Declaration of Independence, and they knew they, there was no chance of Jefferson ever doing that. So, All of Hamilton's references to Caesar and his private correspondence were negative, with the sole exception of one neutral reference to the Romans' military skills. So Hamilton clearly did not look up to Caesar. Uh, indeed, uh, although Hamilton was well aware that detractors compared him to Caesar, he considered his opponents more deserving of that infamous name. In 1792, Hamilton called the Democratic Republicans, the other party, the, quote, Caesars of the community, a description of men to be found in every republic who, leading the dance to the tune of liberty without law, 
endeavor to intoxicate the people with delicious but poisonous drafts to render them the easier victims of their rapacious ambition. It's quite a sentence. Hamilton left no doubt regarding the particular Democratic Republicans to whom he referred. In the same essay, he concluded regarding Jefferson, quote, but there is always a first time when characters studious of artful disguises are unveiled, when the visor of stoicism is plucked from the brow of the Epicurean, when the plain garb of Quaker simplicity is stripped from the concealed voluptuary, when Caesar, coyly refusing the preferred diadem, is seen to be Caesar rejecting the trappings but tenaciously grasping the substance of imperial domination. I'm talking about Jefferson. Three days earlier, Hamilton had declared, in a word, if we have an embryo Caesar in the United States, tis Burr. He was the other leader of, one of the other leaders of the Democratic Republican Party, Aaron Burr. The ancients also provided the founders with societal anti-models. For instance, some founders, not all, but some uh, perceived Greek and Roman slavery as an anti-model. As early as 1765, George Mason re wrote regarding the Roman Republic, one of the first signs of the decay and perhaps the primary cause of the destruction of the most flourishing government that ever existed was the introduction of great numbers of slaves, an evil very pathetically described by Roman historians. On August 22, 1787, during the important debate over the impartation of slaves at the Constitutional Convention, Charles Pinckney responded to George Mason's charge that slavery was an immoral and dangerous institution. James Madison recorded Pinckney's rebuttal, quote, if slavery be wrong, it is justified by the example of all the world. He cited the case of Greece, Rome, and other ancient states. But John Dickinson retorted, Greece and Rome were made unhappy by their slaves. The ancients also provided the founders with governmental anti-models. The most important anti-model was the Roman Empire. During the Revolution, the Patriots often compared Britain to the Roman Empire, and the Anti-Federalists later expressed fear that the U.S. Constitution, by creating a powerful presidency and allowing a standing army, an army in, in time of peace, would pave the way for the rise of emperors. But the founders uncovered imperfections even in their favorite ancient republics. Although the classical republics could serve as rough models, approximate models, they obviously suffered from fatal flaws, else they would not have been replaced by tyrannies. Thus, the founders' scrutiny of the ancient republics frequently resembled autopsies, the purpose of which was to save the life of the American body politic by uncovering the cancerous growths that, it, that had caused the demise of its ideological ancestors. Thus, although the Federalists saw the ancient Greek confederacies as significant models of federalism, they frequently contended that these confederacies had fallen due to decentralization. Thus, a new constitution that granted more, federal, more power to the federal government was needed to replace the Articles of Confederation, the nation's first constitution. Unfortunately, the same visceral fear of conspiracies that instilled in the founders a passionate love of liberty and a proper recognition of its fragility also fueled the tendency to see, to see a conspiracy behind every well-intentioned blunder, a conspirator in every opponent. So great was the founders' fear of conspiracy, a fear derived largely from their lifelong immersion in classical political horror stories that both the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans could equate one another, their recent partners in the struggle against British tyranny, with Caesar and could accuse one another of conspiring against the Republic. There was a dark side to the sense of identity and purpose that the classical authors bequeathed the founders. It required fresh threats of tyranny for sustenance. Where such threats did not exist, they must be created. Yet, in retrospect, the paranoia of the early Republican period was a small price to pay for the success of the revolution. 
The classics gave the founders the courage to face the great challenges of their time. During the Revolutionary Era, the classics provided an indispensable illusion of precedent for actions that were essentially unprecedented. In an age in which rebellion was considered an act of the darkest villainy and rebels were summarily hanged, ancient history enabled the essentially conservative American revolutionaries to argue that they were preserving past liberties rather than presumptuously tinkering with the natural order. It, en it enabled them to portray the king as the real rebel, the violator of that natural law which lawful patriots would die to defend. Without this illusion of precedent, it is unlikely that the founders could have persuaded themselves and many other Americans to rebel against the mother country. The American Revolution was a paradox, a revolution fueled by tradition. The classics also provided the founders with three of the, of the four most important theories enacted in the US Constitution. The fourth one is the uh, modern theory of the separation of powers. Uh, but the other three theories, the theories of popular sovereignty, mixed government, and natural law were Greek in origin, classical in origin. Uh, first of all, popular sovereignty. The Stoics, the Greek Stoics and later the Roman Stoics too, placed a particular emphasis on the idea that all political authority derived from the people. So universally accepted was the belief in popular sovereignty in the classical world that even the edicts of the Roman emperors were considered law not merely because they represented the will of the emperor but, but because the people had supposedly consented to that mode of legislation. The Roman jurist Opian declared, the will of the prince has the force of law because the people conferred on him all its power. In 1775, John Adams was able to write regarding the popular sovereignty theory that underlay American resistance to British measures, quote, these are what are called revolution principles. They are the principles of Aristotle and Plato of Livy and Cicero, of Sidney, Harrington, and Locke, the principles of nature and eternal reason. In ensuring popular consent for the form of government, the founders built on the work of the Puritans. Before the Puritans, consent had never implied participation. Popular consent was demonstrated by the mere absence of rebellion. But the Puritans decided that popular consent for the form of government could be established beyond doubt only through the drafting of written compacts, constitutions, signed by every adult male. The first written constitution was the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, 1639. The written constitution is perhaps America's greatest contribution to political science. This distinctively American process for establishing consent underwent numerous revisions in the last quarter of the 18th century, a period in which Americans drafted and ratified 25 state and two federal constitutions. Americans eventually decided that consent must be established through drafting conventions, popular ratification of the Constitution, and amendment procedures. The drafting convention was a special convention whose delegates were elected for the sole purpose of drafting a constitution. That's what the Constitutional Convention of 1787 was. Thus, it was a better means of establishing popular consent than having legislatures, interested party whose, parties whose members had been elected for other reasons, draft constitutions. Uh, secondly, we have direct popular ratification ensured that the Constitution was approved by a majority of the citizens. And in this case, it took the form of state conventions, state ratifying conventions. And finally, amendment procedures created a mechanism for peaceful change of the government form. In 1780, Massachusetts became the first state to provide for all three of these means of establishing consent for a constitution. Second theory, mixed government theory. The founders derived mixed government theory from the writings of Plato, Aristotle, Polybius, and Cicero. Plato in the Laws and the Politicus was the first to suggest that the best system of government uh, balanced the power of the one, the few, and the many, the king or executive, the aristocrats, and the common people. 
Now this theory, as most people know, represented a marked departure from the theory contained in the Republic uh, more than a decade earlier, which was an oligarchy of guardians led by a philosopher king. So, so it's, it's a big change in Plato's ideas. Aristotle then immortalized mixed government theory, making it the centerpiece of his politics, in which he cited numerous examples of mixed government in the ancient world. In the second century BC, the Greek historian Polybius presented the Roman Republic as the most outstanding example of mixed government. He claimed that the Roman Constitution, with its alleged balance between the consuls, who are sort of not the one but the two, I guess, the Senate, who represent the aristocrats, and the tribal assembly, who represents the, the common people, was the secret of Roman success. Such was the beguiling clarity and simplicity of Polybius's analysis that he even convinced the Romans themselves that their complex system of balances was the chief cause of their success. For instance, Cicero seized upon Polybius's theory to thwart the increasing efforts of ambitious Romans to consolidate their own power at the Republic's expense. Modern Republicans then added Great Britain with its balance between the king, the one, the House of Lords representing the aristocrats, and the House of Commons to the pantheon of mixed government systems. During the 1760s, the American revolutionaries blamed Parliament's unconstitutional taxes on a degeneration of the alleged, of the mixture, alleged mixture of the English Constitution. They noted that the king had used his patronage powers to buy the House of Commons and to pack the House of Lords. The framers of the state constitutions adopted mixed governments, though substituting an elected governor for the king and an assembly of wealth for the House of Lords. The founders also established a mixed government at the federal level in the US Constitution. James Madison, who is often called the father of the Constitution because he had the most influence in writing it, argued for a nine-year term for US senators, which in those days was even larger than the six-year term they agreed on. And he, he said the reason for this was that the chief function of the Senate would be to, quote, protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. So that's mixed government, the idea that the Senate would represent the aristocrats against the against mob rule, basically, the masses. In Madison's notes for Federalist Number 63, in which he again championed, uh, championed an aristocratic Senate, Madison cited Aristotle, Polybius, and Cicero, all supporters of mixed government and opponents of simple democracy, where the majority has all the, the power. Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, John Dickinson, and numerous other founders endorsed the Constitution as having established a mixed government. Power was balanced between the president, the, the one, the Senate, representing the few, and the House of Representatives. That is, between a fairly powerful monarch selected by the Electoral College, a limited monarch, but still fairly powerful, an assembly of wealth selected by the state legislatures for long terms, six-year terms, and a democratic body elected by the people every two years, the House. Now, within a few years of the ratification of the Constitution, Democratic Republicans like Jefferson and Madison shifted their support from mixed government to a more democratic system. After all, their party, the, the Democratic Republican Party, was the party of the farmers, who was the vast, the vast majority, so naturally they wanted the majority to have more power. Uh, the Democratic reforms they promoted successfully, including tying the selection of the Electoral College to a popular vote, and the elimination of property qualifications for voting. Even then, they turned to the classics for support, in particular to the classical pastoral tradition, which was a heritage as ancient and revered as mixed government theory. The Democratic Republicans comforted, them, comforted them, themselves with the notion that the United States could safely adopt a more democratic system, however much a simple democracy might be vilified by classical political theorists, because the abundance of land in the United States would allow a citizenry of Virgilian farmers. They turned not only to the Augustan poets like Virgil and Horace, who had considered the rural agricultural lifestyle a source of Republican virtue, but also to ancient historians 
who had attributed the triumph of Sparta and Rome over their vice-ridden commercial adversaries, Athens and Carthage, as much to their pastoral virtues as to their government forms. Both produce virtue, the agricultural life by fostering frugality, temperance, and independence, the balanced constitution by encouraging moderation, cooperation, and compromise. The plow was both the symbol and the cause of Cincinnatus so-called Roman virtue. Give one example. Thomas Jefferson so cherished the pastoral tradition that he read Roman agricultural treatises for entertainment. He designed his estate to resemble the Roman villas that Pliny and Varro had described. And he planned to inscribe a large passage from Horace's second epode which, uh, regarding the joys of the rural life near a small temple that he hoped to build on his own burial ground. In fact, Jefferson was so determined to perpetuate the agricultural character of the United States that he was even willing to violate strict construction of the Constitution, sacred principles of his party and, and of himself, in order to purchase Louisiana. When the absence of a constitutional provision allowing Jefferson to buy foreign territory threatened the future of the Republic's agricultural base and thus its virtue and longevity, Jefferson reluctantly sacrificed his constitutional scruples in order to extend the life of the Republic. The founders also derived from the Stoics the concept of natural law, a universal code of ethics compre comprehensible to humans through a combination of intuition and reason acting on experience. This theory had been transformed by modern Republicans into the doctrine of natural rights, which became the basis for the United States federal and state bills of rights. So three out of the four theories that went into the Constitution came from the ancients, the classical sources. Since the founders derived their con conception of classical virtue from the martyrs and historians of the late Roman Republic and the early empire, which was the zenith of Stoic popularity, Stoicism contrib contributed much to their conception of virtue as well. Influenced by Cicero, Seneca, and the Roman historians, as well as by modern philosophers, like the common sense philosophers of Scotland, for instance, influenced by the Stoics, the founders perceived the nature and purpose of virtue in Stoic terms. Even George Washington, who was unphilosophical by nature, imbibed Stoicism at an early age. The Fairfaxes, whom Washington considered his second family, because his father died when he was about 11, so he, uh, he, had, he, he sort of looked to the Fairfaxes as a second family. Uh, they read Marcus Aurelius and the other Stoics. At the age of 17, Washington read Sir Roger Lestrange's English translation of Seneca's principal dialogues. As the historian Samuel Eliot Morrison noted, the mere chapter headings are the moral axioms that Washington followed through, throughout life. As a result of their stoicism, the founders equated Roman virtue with frugality, simplicity, temperance, fortitude, love of liberty, selflessness, and honor. Stoicism also provided an important source of solace for the founders giving them the courage to face old age, death, and other hardships. The Stoics helped Jefferson endure the passing of his father, his favorite sister, and his wife. Young Jefferson's literary commonplace book overflows with Stoic quotations regarding the certainty of sorrow in this world and the need to endure it patiently. The first volume of Seneca's works lay on Jefferson's reading table when he died. John Adams turned to the Stoics in the wake of his wife Abigail's death. Stoicism was a source of solace to young George Washington in his dealings with Sally Fairfax, the wife of his best friend, a woman whom he loved but could not have. Washington's Stoicism enabled him to exercise restraint and to adopt the practical solution of marriage to Martha Custis. So in conclusion, the classics furnished the founders with a common set of symbols, knowledge, and ideas, a literature select enough to provide common ground between them. 
yet rich enough to address a wide range of human problems from a variety of perspectives. Although it is true that the founders' unique concerns helped shape their interpretation of the classics, it is equally true that the classical themes that pervaded their world helped identify and define those concerns. Just as minds constantly reshape intellectual tools, such tools also leave an indelible imprint on the minds of those accustomed to using them. 